Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring surrealism and spontaneity in literature, poetry, and art. My guest is my dear cousin, my first cousin, Zach Rogo. He is an author, editor, and translator of 20 books or plays. His most recent book of poems is called Irreverent Litanies, and I think we'll get him to read a few of his poems during this interview. His other books of poetry include Talking with the Radio, poems inspired by jazz and popular music. His play, Colette Uncensored, co-authored with Laurie Holt, had its first public reading at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., and has subsequently been performed in Berkeley, California, and in London. He is the editor of an anthology of poetry from the United States called The Face of Poetry, published by the University of California Press. He has also translated two books by the godfather of the Surrealist movement, the French poet and artist André Breton. These are Arcanum 17, based on the tarot deck, and Earthlight, which won the Book of the Month Club and Pen Award for Translations in Literature. Zachary is based in the San Francisco Bay Area, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Zach. It's a real pleasure to be with you on New Thinking Aloud. Thank you, Jeffrey. I'm very pleased to be talking with you. We're going to talk about spontaneity in literature, poetry, and in art, and of course the Surrealist movement, which you've studied because of your translations of the works of André Breton. I, I think some of our viewers won't know what Surrealism really is all about, what it means. Maybe we could start with a definition. Well, Surrealism was an artistic movement that started in the mid-1920s, and it's a movement that brings the imagery of dreams and visions and daydreams and the subconscious into art. How does it differ from some of the other artistic movements of the early 20th century? Well, the Surrealists were very interested in psychology. André Breton who you just mentioned, who was uh, the leader of the Surrealist movement, he actually visited Sigmund Freud on his honeymoon in Vienna. And so he was very interested in psychology. And they were particularly interested in the spontaneous creations of the human brain and how spontaneity could, um, could, could bring forth a kind of creativity and a depth of... Um, a depth of expression that couldn't be accessed by more conscious or self-conscious art. I think many people will be familiar with the work of Salvador Dali. His uh, art pieces have, I think, sold billions of dollars worth. And I, he, he's probably the most popular of the surrealist visual artists. Yes, Dali was, was a, a founding member, I believe, of the surrealist group. And Dali was, was probably the most um, uh, iconic of the Surrealists because he, he created these images of dreams and fantasies that are unforgettable. But actually, Dali ran afoul of the, of the Surrealist leaders, particularly Breton, because, um, well, he was quite successful. He made a lot of money. And the Surrealists were very much uh, political radicals who didn't believe that art should be a money-making enterprise. And so there was a point where Breton actually expelled Dali from the Surrealist movement. And there was kind of a trial where all the Surrealists got together. And Dali showed up for the trial wearing layers and layers of clothing, coats on coats on coats in a very Surrealist manner with a thermometer sticking out of his mouth and said, I'm sick, I'm sick, you know, I can't attend. And Breton said, no, no, we're going ahead with the trial. And in the course of the trial, Dali stripped off one by one all of these garments until he was down to his underwear by the end of the trial. 
and they still expelled him from the surrealist movement that day because because of his well it wasn't just his 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 money making but he he politically did not align with the surrealists because they were they were very much progressives and radicals and dali was was apolitical verging on right wing i would say I seem to recall that he supported the fascists during the Spanish Revolution or Civil War. He was not unfriendly to them. Yes, correct. That is correct. But it's very interesting that the Surrealists had such a structured organization, a hierarchy with Andre Breton as sort of the godfather. Some people called him the Pope of Surrealism. So what was so ironic about the Surrealist movement was that here were some of the most creative artists and writers of the 20th century, and yet they were in this rather cult-like movement where they got together every afternoon. I mean, this, I think, was part of the fun of the Surrealist movement. They would get together at a cafe at the end of the day, and they would all report on their Surrealist adventures, which sometimes involved just walking around the streets of Paris and having random encounters with people or objects. And uh, But they had to report back every day about what they were doing. And if you were doing something that wasn't approved by the Surrealists, like, God forbid, writing a novel, that, that uh, provoked the ire of Breton and the other members of the group. I seem to recall, however, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that Breton's most famous work was a novel. That's true, yes. He kind of um, backtracked on that. You know, he wrote the book Nanja which is a wonderful book about exploring Paris and encountering people at random. They were very much believers in the random and coincidence. Breton once called, talked about the one light of, co of coincidence, and they believed that chance and coincidence was one of the fundamental principles, though those were fundamental principles of art. I honestly, I'm not aware of any other movement that encompassed both the visual arts and poetry and literature. Well, that, that's a very interesting point. I'm trying to think now. You could say symbolism, which was a um, precursor of surrealism. The symbolist poets, such as Baudelaire and Rambeau, were very much inspirations. And there was also a symbolist movement in art. That included, for example, the spiritual artist Odilon Redon, who you may be familiar with. Um, the symbolists were also visual artists, though their visual art is much less well known than the surrealists, but worth looking into if you're a fan of the visual art. Breton is a very interesting figure. You've translated two of his books, and uh, he as well as the other Surrealists, had a deep interest, not only in esoteric culture, mysticism, coincidence, but actually, to my understanding, even an awareness, a serious awareness of psychical research and scientific parapsychology. They were very interested in that, yes. And Breton had an encyclopedic knowledge of the occult. And one of the books I translated of his is called Arcanum 17, and it's named after the card, the star in the major arcana of the tarot. So he was very interested in tarot. He was very interested in psychics and, and seers, people who predicted the future. He was very interested in um, alchemy. So, for example, there, there was a game the Surrealists had that they called they played a lot of games together. That was one of the things that they did. They had some wonderful games that they made up. And um, they had a game called One and the Other. And One and the Other was based on the idea in alchemy that every thing contains the seed of every other thing in the universe. And so what they believed was that you could describe any one thing by any other thing. So what, what they do is a group of people would get together and one person was it and they would leave the room. And then the other people would think of a thing. In the most famous example of this, the group thought of the, the idea of a lit match, like you'd strike a match. And Breton was it, and he went out of the room, and he thought of a different thing. He thought of a lion. 
And so Breton comes back into the room and the group says, okay, describe a match. But Breton had to describe it as if it was a lion, but he didn't tell them what it was he was thinking of when he was describing. And he said, I am thinking of a match with a mane of fire. So I thought I would read a poem maybe that relates to this. And it's kind of a guessing game. So I'd ask your viewers to, to play along with the game. So I'm going to describe something using a completely different set of images. I'm going to switch here to my other glasses for a second. I want your, your viewers and you, Jeffrey, to guess what the other thing is that I'm actually describing. I think it'll make sense once I start, okay? I'm thinking of a cloud you can put on a chain and carry in your pocket. I'm thinking of a cloud of shining steel. I'm thinking how no two clouds are identical. I'm thinking of a cloud that slides over a box and rips its seal. I'm thinking of a cloud with jagged edges that can open a door. So I'll give everyone a minute to, um, to guess what that other thing is that I'm actually describing. Jeffrey, do you want to take a guess? <laughs> I, I, you know, the image that comes to mind is something like a, a, a hunting knife with jagged edges. Well, you're close. You're close. But think about, I'm thinking of a cloud with jagged edges that can open a door. What do we usually use? Well, a, a key, of course. Right, right, a key. Okay. So here's another one. I'm a wish that starts as a tiny egg. I'm a wish that crawls first and then grows wings. I'm a wish you can only see at night. I'm a wish that leaves trails on the darkness. So what do you think I'm really describing? What's the other thing I'm describing? Maybe something like a glow worm or a, an insect that glows. Right, a firefly. A firefly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll read one more like this. Okay. Okay. I'm thinking of lips you see in the street. I'm thinking of lips that form a perfect circle. I'm thinking of lips with a name molded into them. I'm thinking of lips poured from molten steel. I'm thinking of lips so heavy it takes a strong person to open them. I'm thinking of lips that reveal a world beneath our world. That's a manhole cover. Right, right. <laughs> Andre Breton loved manhole covers. He, he loved all the little things you could find, like in the streets of Paris that were kind of, you know, just sort of found objects. You know, the Surrealists and the Dadaists, who were another artistic movement that preceded Surrealism, they were very interested in found objects. You know, things that you'd find that had a kind of artistic resonance to them, even though they may not have been designed to be works of art. Well, as I recall, Marcel Duchamp famously took a urinal and put it in a museum. Correct, right. He turned it upside down, I think, so that, it, so that you could see its visual properties rather than what it was its practical use. So you, you were just reading, I presume, from your new book of poetry. Yeah, I was reading from uh, Irreverent Litanies, which um, is a book that came out uh, about a year ago. And a lot of the poems are inspired by surrealism. Actually, I started writing the book during the time that my son was preparing for his bar mitzvah. And uh, I grew up in a kind of militantly atheist house. My mother was, was very much a, a humanist, and she, um, she, she, she did not believe in any organized religion. And my son decided that he wanted to have the full bar mitzvah, you know, with, with, uh, with, with all in a conservative synagogue. And so I had to kind of think through, again, my own thoughts about spirituality, because it made me really confront what it was in spiritual traditions that that still had a claim on me. And so this book is, is a kind of personal journal of, of, of whether 
of trying to trying to do an inventory in a way of, of you know how how much the spiritual traditions really are pulling at me and 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 what what's what's still left for me of those you know organized traditions i think probably most people from militant atheists to orthodox believers have this struggle at one level or another I mean, the struggles are what's interesting, right? I mean, the struggles are the, the part that bring up the questions. And, you know, in some ways, the questions are more interesting than the answers sometimes, because um, it's it's the good questions that give rise to the good good arguments and discussions and, and turning points in our lives. So do you have another poem that uh, reflects the good questions and the struggle? I'm going to read a poem called Dayenu. And many people might know that there's a song in the in the Jewish Passover Seder called Dayenu. It's a beautiful song. It goes, Dai, Dayenu, Dai, Dayenu. And what Dayenu means is, in Hebrew, it would have been enough. So in the song, it says, if God had just left, and God had just led the Jews out of slavery, that would have been enough. If God had just parted the Red Seas, that would have been enough. If God had brought man of down from heaven, that would have been enough. So what I tried to do is to apply this idea to cosmology and to the whole evolution of the universe. And so this is called Dianu. If there had been only stars with their stitches of light and no planets, that would have been enough. If there had been only lifeless planets with strands of quartz and gold, Dianu. If there had been just the breathing oceans vaulting against boulders, only microorganisms with their endless division and multiplication. If there had been only forests of coral, merely the minnows, their tiny hearts flicking inside glass bodies. If there had been only the firefish, the butterfly fish, and seahorses disguised as kelp. Only the desert and its runnels of sand. Just green beards of grass, no redwoods. If there had been only black onyx, no lemon serpentine, no azurite. Only the insects with their x-ray wings and flashing songs. Just the geometry of snake skins, no mammals. Only gray mice, their hearts valving 600 times a minute. If there had been nothing but a hummingbird pinning itself in midair. Only the elephant with its vault of bones. Only the zebra so unaware of its own beauty. Only monkeys chattering their no language. That would have been enough. Only the first humans weighing their young in their arms. Dianu. Only that and not the peacock domes of Isfahan. Not the mood indigo of Ella's Ellington album. Only the white stone garden of Rio Anji Temple, where no viewer can view every dark rock, no broken torso of Apollo, or acts of love beyond number, would it really have been enough? I'm very touched. That's, that's a wonderful poem. Well, thank you. You know, I, I think that the, the thing that about Diana that makes me really think, the song Diana, is that it's kind of about the plenitude of life and the universe. And at what point is there enough plenitude? And um, I, I don't know if there's ever enough. In a way, there's never enough. That, that, that the continue, continued unfolding of the universe is a kind of necessary part of the plenitude. It, yeah, we have so much to be grateful for, and yet it seems part of human nature to always be reaching out for a little more. Which is a good thing, in a way, I think. I mean, it can be it can be unsettling. It can be unsettling to always look for more and not be satisfied with the present. And yet that, that is part of our, our nature, yes. Would you consider yourself a surrealist, Zach? Well, not exactly, because the Surrealists had a very definite method of composition. So they believed in spontaneity. And Breton, and people have actually gone over his manuscripts and looked at whether he edited his manuscripts. And he did not edit his manuscripts very much. 
So he believed that the spontaneous outpouring of the subconscious was the true art. And he was good enough at this that he could spontaneously compose poems with very little editing. Well, very few of us are that gifted. <laughs> that's, that's a very unique, um, uh, unique blessing to have as an artist, to be able to compose spontaneously. Most of us have to do draft after draft after draft. So I do edit my work. But what I take from the Surrealists is that daring to kind of go beyond what the conscious mind thinks it's capable of. So one of the more broad topics that I'm hoping we can explore is the whole idea of spontaneity. And I think that we have a kind of intelligence that comes out in spontaneity that we don't even know that we have. And we surprise ourselves sometimes. And one example is just telling, a, telling something funny, saying something funny in the course of a conversation. If someone is saying something funny, they don't know what it is they're going to say usually. Because usually wit happens just in this spark of a moment. And you don't really know when you're about to say something funny what you're going to say. And yet it's there in your soul or your mind. And so the surrealists, I think, were drawing on that part of the human consciousness that, um, and, and again, jazz improvisation is another example of this. When you improvise in music, you don't know exactly what, and John Coltrane didn't know what he was going to play when he started a riff. And yet somewhere in, in John Coltrane, there was that music that poured out. So I think one of the most productive things for, for creativity is to allow that spontaneous intelligence to to come forward and to um, to inspire us. Well, I uh, kind of agree with that. When I do these interviews, you know, I don't work from notes. I don't work from an outline. Uh, a lot of authors come and hand me their list here, the twenty questions you should ask me, and I uh, I never even read them. <laughs> I think that's great. Jeffrey, I hope I hope that that is a productive um, method. It se it seems to work for me, Zach. But the key, I think, is that I do prepare. I actually read their books, which is something that a lot of interviewers will never do. I think that's true. You know, I re I remember um, my my literary mentor um, was a wonderful poet by the name of June Jordan, who was my advisor, both undergraduate and graduate. Um, very inspiring poet who also wrote many other things from screenplays to uh, song lyrics. And uh, June told me she once went to Joseph Papp, who founded the Public Theater in New York, with an idea for a play. And um, they had a meeting to discuss whether he might produce the play. And she told me he had, he had not read the play. And she was just dumbfounded by this. How is it possible that someone could make a decision like this without actually, um, but some people do. I mean, that's, it's, it's, but I think that's a, a tribute to your dedication to what you do that you actually prepare. And that I'm sure that that bears fruit. Spontaneity is important, but it also, I, I would imagine it, if you're going to employ it as an artist, you also need to combine it with some discipline. Well, I certainly find that, yes. I mean, I, I think that in the moment when we're composing, everything feels perfect, which is a great feeling. I love it. I mean, that's part of why I'm an artist is for that rush of inspiration. But then when you look at it the next day or even a month or two months or three months later, um, you, you see all the, the warts and uh, you, you have to start um, the, the hard work. And I think the hardest work is is getting that objectivity and seeing your own work as though you're someone from outside looking at this. It's kind of why I, I really like the idea of the muse, the, the Greek idea that there were, there were muses that inspired artists. Because if you think about the art as not coming from you, but coming through you, and that it's, it's some other force, call it the muse, that, um, that sends the, the art to you, then you become less possessive about your own artwork and you're more willing to edit because you don't, you feel like you're, 
your job is to make the work as good as it can possibly be, rather than to make it the way you want it to be, if that makes any sense. Well, you know, I'm mostly accustomed to writing nonfiction, and it's very different than the kind of uh, work that one would do as a as a poet. Uh, one one of um, the really good nonfiction writers I interviewed recently, Dean Radin, whose books are quite popular, and I asked him, "What's your trick?" To writing, and he said, "Well, I usually edit my books twenty or thirty times before they go to the publisher, and when I edit them, I try to think about what would my mother say. Would my mother, who is completely unfamiliar with this field of study, would she follow what I'm trying to accomplish here?" But I imagine that when you are editing a poem, you have something very different in mind. Well, I I do agree with with. Dean Rader, that there there is a reader out there that you're thinking about, yes, and you want that reader to get what it is that you're you're trying to communicate because our all art is communication. I think we are some artists forget that sometimes because they get so enraptured with the with the inspiration and their own inspiration that they sometimes forget the other side of the relationship because art is a relationship between the artist. And the public who are receiving it and enjoying it and interacting with it. So I, I do think about that. I do think: Is someone going to get what it is I'm referring to here, or is there a better word I could use that would communicate this? That people, but there, you, you don't want to compromise your own vision, though, because so much of what you're, do, what I do as an artist, and probably what a lot of artists do, is express their own personal vision. So there's a tension there that you've, it's, it's a tightrope that you're, you're constantly walking. And yet that's part of the fun, I think, of being a creative artist is thinking about, about those questions. You know, how, how do I satisfy myself as an artist and feel like I've done the best I can? And yet how do I communicate to, to, to someone who may not know anything about the topics that I'm that I'm talking about. What would what would a twelve-year-old girl in a village in Pakistan make of my poem? Would she understand this poem? So not necessarily my mother, <laughs> but somebody completely on the other side of the world. Or what would a, what would someone in a hundred years make of this poem? Would they understand it? Is that important? Whether somebody a hundred years from now would know what I was talking about? There is a field of study called hermeneutics, which I think has to do with the, this idea that when you try to interpret or translate a work of literature, it's going to be looked at differently depending on the culture and the perspective of the interpreter. Well, that's very true. That's very true. And when you work as a translator, as I do, you, you see that because there are certain things that are nearly untranslatable. Um, I'm trying to think of Breton's work of examples like that. I mean, there, there, there are references that are so well known to French people um, that Breton, Breton might mention a neighborhood in Paris and it would have a very definite resonance for somebody. Um, you know, if he says the, the fifth arrondissement, you know, everyone knows that's the Latin quarter. But, uh, you know, if you say the fifth arrondissement, to most people here, they would think, oh, well, maybe that's Paris. You know, it wouldn't have the same visual memory, you know, for, for people. So, yeah, it's true. I mean, everyone brings their own, their own life experience to, to the artwork as well. I wonder if before we close our interview, you wouldn't mind reading a few more of uh, your poems. Sure, yes. Well, this poem is a little bit inspired by Breton because it's a kind of, I was talking about how the surrealists sort of pour out their work and it's, it's a kind of almost like a stream of consciousness. So this poem is, is a bit like that. It's called Credo. And Credo, um, a Credo is, is, a, is a belief system. In Latin, the word Credo means I believe. I believe that gravity is a temporary condition. 
I believe that all forms of blue cheese are sacred. Why else would they call it gorgonzola? I believe that dental assistants get so moralistic about flossing because their work brings them terribly close to God. I believe there are such people as spiritual healers and they are overpaid. I believe in a radical democratic equality where your cousin is entitled to listen to Neil Diamond. I believe that anyone who contributes to the extinction of a species should spend 10 years in the jungle surviving on gathered plants. I believe the designated hitter is an abomination. I believe that there are alternate realities where Paul Clay would be considered a photorealist. I believe that all nations and ethnic groups have a right to self-determination in order to make their own disastrous mistakes. I believe in a universal treaty of human population reduction that every country will participate in proportionately. Easy enough to negotiate, right? I believe that women were put on earth to satisfy men and other women, and that men were put on earth to satisfy women and other men. Yes, I believe that the universe does not necessarily have a purpose, but if it does, it might be hazelnut gelato. I believe that five days a year, people should be allowed to come into work late just because they stayed up till dawn. I believe that paying for memberships in gyms and pools creates a mysterious barrier to exercise. I believe that those who obey every rule should hike to the North Pole in stiletto heels. I believe that love is the most perfect thing and therefore not practical for humans. Wait, I don't believe the second part. I believe that music is the most supreme speech and that speech is the most supreme music. I believe all languages are spattered full of moonstones, jaspers, star rubies, and jade. I believe that poems should end before their readers start to think about their next meal. And I believe in the power of beauty to redeem all things, especially broken snowmobiles, highway entrance ramps, and airport bathroom sinks that send to your hands, praying for the water to flow. Well, I see why you call it an irreverent litany. Yes, well, this, this poem is, is a litany in the sense that every line begins with the same phrase, but it's irreverent in the sense that it, it sort of questions a lot of, uh, a lot of widely held beliefs. Your poetry is really wonderful, Zach. I'd be very happy if you'd read one or two more. There was a period when I was commuting. I live, I live in San Francisco, and for many years I commuted down to Silicon Valley, as so many people did. There's an incredible flow of traffic of people commuting down on Highway 280 or 101 towards Silicon Valley, although right now it's, it's very much different. And it's a beautiful commute in some ways. It's visually beautiful, and yet there's something very paradoxical about being part of this flow of, this massive flow of cars going in one direction in the morning and the other in the afternoon. So I wrote this poem in response. It's called Fossils and Fuels, The Evening Commute. The traffic on 280 laps up gas as it lashes around the hills above the Crystal Springs Reservoir. The oncoming headlights form a Nile of fireflies. Ahead, taillights brighten like blown embers. Each bubble of music chases the one in front, double digits of lanes and all of them saturated. As the coastal mountains lean toward the setting sun, the rays transform the water into a matador's suit of lights. It's beautiful, the evening commute. Beautiful as a bullfight. I've been on that highway many times during uh, the decades that I lived in the Bay Area. So it, it certainly captures the feeling of uh, riding on 280. It's a wonderful highway, actually. Yes. I mean, it is such a strange thing now that we're we're in this period in history where we're still dependent on fossil fuels, but we know we know that era is coming to an end. 
And um, it's, it's just a strange kind of split consciousness to have that we're, we're, we're part of this, this moment where we're despoiling the earth to a great degree. And yet we know that, that, that we have to turn the corner on that. Well, not only that, the truth is that the petroleum fuel source isn't going to last forever. And not a lot longer. So, I mean, it's possible that cars will exist in a different context, but many things are going to change, as we know. And, uh, and fortunately, that's already happening. You know, even, even the auto companies, I think, know it's already happening and are moving in that direction. I've been driving an electric car for five years now. Oh, that's great. That's great. Can you read one more, Zach? Maybe I'll read a sonnet. You know, sonnets are very old-fashioned, but I, I do love the sonnet. And one poet who was, who was a great master of the sonnet was William Wordsworth, the, the poet of the English Romantic period. And I think in many ways the Romantic period was a kind of forerunner of our own time because it was the beginning of when industrialization was 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 shaping the world so um so radically that that people were reacting against it and people like wordsworth and his circle of 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 uh, artists were moving back to the countryside as a way of um escaping from the you know the the degradation of of uh of, of industrialization. And so I wrote a sonnet for Wordsworth because he, he, he was so good at the sonnet. And this is about some things that I think Wordsworth would, would identify with. It's called, If Wordsworth Were Alive Today. Wordsworth, if you were here alive today in cities of ditto department blocks, identical as soldiers' grave white rocks. What would you think of us? What could you say of glaciers turned to ghosts, herons robed in oil, and gyred tides of polyethylene that leatherbacks mistake for jelly's sheen? I wonder if you'd fly from all this spoil. Or would you dive into the present mode, denounce steam coal fracked veins, the dollar trap, take a day job as an art custodian, and maybe teach yourself software to code a write your own romantic poem app, while nights you learn to cook Cambodian. So I was kind of imagining that Wordsworth, you know, what would he do if he were alive today? You know, in some ways, I think he'd be even more horrified than he was then by, by what industrialization and overpopulation have done to our planet. But in some ways, I think he might be just the person to inspire us to make the best of this and to, um, to find a way to be a creative person in this, in this time period. Well, Zachary Rogo, this has been a, an inspiring conversation. I'm delighted to have you read your poems and to be able to share you with the New Thinking Aloud audience, not only because you're, you're a stimulating poet, but because we're family. And I think it's, it's, this is the first opportunity I've ever had on New Thinking Aloud to share a family member uh, with, with the audience. So I want to thank you so much, Zach, and I hope uh, we do more of these. Yes, well, thank you, Jeffrey, for inviting me, and thanks to your audience for their attention, and um, this was a lot of fun. Thank you. For those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.